Hi folks, I'm Chris. Thanks for coming back. You might have noticed I renamed my channel, so welcome to It Had To Be Said. I hope you got to see the introduction video on The Political Compass, which I posted last week, but even if not, you might still be able to follow this one about the left. The left is a very diverse group of people who are united, philosophically speaking, in their opposition to capitalism. Most people on the left would also call themselves socialists. The further left they go, the more likely they are to call themselves communists. The further down the political compass, the more likely they are to call themselves anarchists or libertarian socialists. And uh, if you go back up the authoritarian scale, there's a whole bunch of different Marxist offshoots people choose from. I don't know if I'm an expert in all forms of socialism and leftist thought. I'm not a representative of the left any more than I'm a representative of white people, cis men, or teachers. Some people who know leftist thought much better than I do disagree with me on all kinds of things and might be able to tell me here uh, if there's anything that I say that's wrong. I'd like to use Wikipedia which I know has its flaws, but like the political compass, it's a tool we can use to think theoretically. Now, um, one thing you need to understand to get socialism is the means of production and, and what that means. So let's start with the Wikipedia article on the means of production. Um, the means of production are physical and non-financial inputs used in the production of economic value. These include raw materials, facilities, machinery, and tools used in the production of goods and services. Okay, so let's go with that for now. Um, so it doesn't use the word capital, but it could be used in the same way. Capital is basically something that you use to make money. Owning the means of production means that you have the final decision about what you do with any capital that produces economic value. If you have a cow and an apple tree, you have enough milk and apples for your family. But a thousand cows and an orchard that you use to make money for yourself is means of production. If you rope off fields and orchards and claim them exclusively, you're claiming private ownership of the means of production. In theory, that would put you on the right. <clears throat> what about a modern office or factory? Well, people on the right should be all right with the current arrangement too. The people at the top get most of the value of the labor and machinery and so on produced by the company, and everyone else has to compete for the scraps that they throw from their table. People on the left think the value produced by labor mixed with capital should belong to those laborers, or perhaps that it should belong to local communities, or else even that it shouldn't be owned by anyone, that it should be commonly shared by everyone and no one should own it exclusively. Um, you might have people in that industry who work to keep the machines running and maybe find ways to make improvements, but the product of what they do would be available to everyone. In such conditions, no one would need to trade or start a business because they'd already have access to everything. Of course, there might be disputes regarding things that are, really are scarce, but strong communities, close ties, norms that favor responsibility and autonomy, these things can resolve most issues. So that kind of thinking puts me down, sorry, down here on the, what says here is the libertarian left. Hmm. Okay, let's look at the Wikipedia article on socialism. Okay, what does it say? Uh, a range of economic and social systems, so there, there's no one kind, but it's characterized by social ownership of the means of production and workers' self-management. 
notice that in this first paragraph or even in any of the paragraphs of the definition here until you get way down here it doesn't even talk about Marx or the USSR or anything like that because socialism exists at least in in some forms exists independent of those things the, the USSR didn't really, as far as, as far as I know, didn't have social ownership of the means of production and workers' self-management. So was it even really socialist? And I look at these things because this isn't something that um, is in huge disagreement exactly. This is socialist theory. So when you're talking about socialism and you're not talking about these things, then you're probably wrong or you're using a, a very uncommon definition. And I run into that quite often. Let's look at the uh, ideas of communism here. Let's look at communism. Um, communism is the ideology and movement whose ultimate goal is the establishment of a communist society. Um, an order structured on common ownership of the means of production and the absence of social classes, money, and the state. If you're talking about communism and you're not talking about the absence of social classes, money, probably property too, and the state, then you're probably not talking about communism. And there's a lot here to look at. Again, feel free, you know, um, a variety of schools of thought, broadly including Marxism and anarchism. Um, and you can read all about it, but what, what you call a, a communist state or a communist country, there really is no such thing. Or at least maybe um, there was in the past, you could say that uh, communism is where we came from in, in a, a society characterized by mutual aid, where we're helping each other. Um, that, that's kind of how we evolved. Small bands, not, not owning things, but sharing things. <clears throat> um, let's look now at anarchism. Anarchism an anti-authoritarian political philosophy that advocates self-managed, self-governed societies based on voluntary, cooperative institutions. It rejects hierarchies, which is pretty important. Stateless societies, got to reject the state. Um, there's still lots of organization, um, but it's through non-hierarchical or free associations. Anarchism holds that the state is undesirable, unnecessary, and harmful. Okay, um, now that's the basics of anarchism. Everything stems from that. So let's, let's think a bit about the implications of these beliefs, of some of these beliefs. Think about the vision of someone who believes in worker self-management. So what, what would change? Well, we would do away with bosses. We would do away with owners and, and directors and, and executives who are at the top who get the lion's share of the value of everything. And it's the workers, the people who are actually doing useful, productive work who would own the output of their labor and of any machinery as well. <coughs> Pardon me the the any machinery and robots automation that are introduced in in the present system mean that workers lose their jobs and they have to go find something find something else where they could get fired and and automated out of a job then but if workers own the means of production then automation would mean that they don't have to work as hard Maybe they can take vacations. What would it mean to have no police? How could people police themselves? Well, there's uh, all kinds of things uh, that have been already been written on this, but, but basically people would find one or another way to enforce their norms or their laws. 
you could say laws. I mean, they're not laws handed down by a central institution, though. So um, laws would look very different in, in this kind of society. What about uh, no money? What would it mean if, if there was no money in society? It would probably mean that uh, everything is available. Everything is free to everybody. And, and I get it. There's an economic calculation problem. But in, in the vision where, um, where there is no more need for, for money, at the end of this process of phasing out money and property and bosses and so on, um, then the economic calculation problem becomes much less significant. If, if, how, how would people make decisions, I think is, is a big question here. Many of our most important decisions are already made by ourselves, and I think in an even freer and more just society, we might have even more decisions to make by ourselves. If it concerns just me, then I'll be the one to decide. If it's something bigger, something I need help with or could do more easily in a group, it'll, the decision will involve other people. That mean, might mean my family, my friends, people who are interested in the thing that I'm doing, like, uh, you know, one's Patreon patrons and GoFundMe funders. I think the most spatially local people should ideally know each other and help each other out and maybe make decisions together. So the people of an apartment building or a farming village or just everybody who lives on this street might make their collective decisions together. And if you think there has to be decision makers with sovereign power over these local com communities, the burden of proof is on you. If you've noticed that these definitions I've been reading don't include anyone in Congress, you're right. Bernie Sanders is not a socialist. He wants to reform capitalism. He wants to do some good things that might cushion the blows of capitalism. Same with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Same with every other congressperson you've ever heard called a socialist. Unless they're just watering down their public statements, and I mean, who knows what they really believe, then the word socialist simply doesn't apply to them. Socialists want to tear down capitalism and throw it on the dump heap of history, not introduce new laws and reforms into a capitalist system that make things a bit more bearable. And I can see the logic of wanting to do that, of course. I just think if we have that many people agreeing with Alexandria, for instance, or Bernie, then they should be engaging in direct action, not hopeful voting. I, I talked all about that in my video on voting, in case you want to learn more, you can check that out. So it's best not to get your understanding of these subjects from, you know, the people on the right. Often when you hear far left or alt left, you know that right wingers in the corporate media are trying to pretend those things are just as bad as the far right or the alt right. They know that's how so many of these so-called centrists think. The truth or the right way is must be somewhere in the middle. But for the most part, the left and the right are opposites, and people who try to unite them have usually ended up giving in to the top right. Leftists are quite open about their beliefs, while the alt-right lie at every turn. Deception, just like racism, power, and violence, is integral to fascist ideology. The left is not the same. For all the hate socialists, communists, and anarchists take, they're quite open about who they are and what they believe, unless they live somewhere they're persecuted for it. That is presumably because freedom, justice, anti-racism, and anti-imperialism, and so on, these are noble virtues, and giving all the power to a white supremacist elite is not. That said, while I wouldn't call them alt-left, I do get why some leftists uh, white might use the term as a term of abuse. There are some people who I would say are way up in the top left 
whose words seem to indicate something's in common with the top right. This might be some slight evidence for what's known as horseshoe theory. The idea that the more extreme one's politics get, uh, the more one comes to resemble the other side. So you can see that here. You know, the, the supposed horseshoe about the center, which again always looks like the right place to be, you know. Um, and then you can see the far left and far right, they kind of start to curve into each other. Mm. <clears throat> it's not super convincing, but again, it's it's there's maybe a little evidence when these when some of these top left people kind of tend toward the top right. On the one hand, I, I have a knee-jerk reaction to the idea that something that's something that's considered extreme must be wrong and must involve violence. It's kind of based on an argument to moderation, which is a logical fallacy, that that the right answer is never the extreme, but somewhere in the middle. But it depends what the status quo is, and whether the course of action designated extreme is preferable. What if we live in cities where people are freezing because all the empty buildings are owned by people who won't let them in? What if people are being blown apart by bombs all over the world because some rich people think they aren't rich enough? What if people are dying of preventable diseases because intellectual property laws make the drugs they need too expensive for them to afford? What if people are enslaved in several parts of the world because people all over the world want phones? What if there's enough food for everyone but people are starving and malnourished in countries all over the world. I could go on, but you get the point. The status quo is extreme, and it's also highly authoritarian almost all over the world, including where you live, because a monopoly on force is given to a small power elite. And it's quite far to the right, because the status quo favors the rich. People just assume that's okay. I saw a headline on Big Think saying surveys said people would rather have, quote, fair inequality than unfair equality, unquote. I was like, how the hell do they think it's fair that people have more money and power than them? Look at how they say, how, look at how they got that money and power. And, and look at what they do with it. And then tell me they deserve it. So you say, don't be extreme, extreme solutions are wrong. I say things are already extreme and the tranquilizing drug of gradualism is not an option. But on the other hand, there are some people in the top left whose views for one reason or another do cross over to the top right. For example, sometimes I hear people who call themselves communists or Maoists or something similar talk about the Jews. Usually you know someone has simplistic and dangerous thoughts about Jews when they talk about the Jews. But that might just be a very small minority in a group that's actually not very easy to define with a political compass like this, least of all with a political horseshoe. And it's hard to say if they truly are leftists, after all, because leftist thought is egalitarian and about the empowerment of downtrodden people, regardless of their ethnicity or religion or some other very broad category. So you can see, you know, putting people in different places because they're a little bit up or down or left or right of someone else, um, from another thing from just from their theoretical views, it doesn't necessarily tell us much about those people. But, however broadly I can speak about the people in the top left, there are reasons why you won't find me there. A lot of people call for um, left unity, in other words, uniting to accomplish our common goals, which makes sense on the surface of it and might be quite productive, so I wouldn't just dismiss it out of hand. But a lot of anarchists are wary of the idea of left unity for several reasons. 
Here's one of them. Marx and Engels said or predicted that following a revolt or the beginning of a revolution, the state would implement socialism by one way or another, and then when it was no longer needed, it would wither away and we would have communism. You know, again, a classless, moneyless, propertyless society with no central authority. People at the top left might be more okay with using force and for a longer period, maybe even forever, in the name of flattening social hierarchy. A lot of them say it makes sense that the Soviet Union, the state, didn't fade away like Marx said it would, or that it was supposed to, because they still needed to take out all the counter-revolutionaries. You know, not during the revolt or during the foreign invasions, but well into the existence of the USSR. That because that took years and they needed to guard against the return of capitalism and, and people who apparently wanted to subvert the state, Conditions just weren't ready for the state to dissolve. Here's why I don't think that way. First, no state has ever withered away. And the reason they don't is the whole purpose of the state is to concentrate power. That means different things in different places, but states or, or aspiring states like Mafia or ISIS, they all exist for the purpose of concentrating power and maintaining it through any amount of violence for the people who control the state. And there are no states who are controlled, who, that have ever been controlled by the people. In the context of the state, there is no the people. All states have only ever been controlled by a minority, they, they only can be controlled by a minority, and exist at the expense of the majority. They do not exist to serve the people. The people should be empowered by finding inside themselves the power to, to fight for freedom and justice and equality, taking back the power as individuals and communities and cultures and nations and as a whole planet. They can be organized along those lines. We see it every day. No one needs to take over and control the institutions with, with a monopoly on the land and on the use of police and military and intelligence when those institutions are the whole problem. Without those things, without police, without a monopoly on guns and so on, or a monopoly on the so-called legitimate use of force, how could capitalists force us into their systems like they have. A big part of socialism and all of communism is flattening social hierarchies. But when you create or take over those hierarchies, you never want to relinquish them. You get sure you have the answers and need ever more power to implement them. You're soon lying, cheating, stabbing people in the back and having them killed because you'll do anything to retain your power. That happens to everyone who has power. Your intentions just don't matter that much. So-called socialist states seem to concentrate ownership of the means of production in their own hands, not in the hands of the workers, which means power is that much more concentrated and it's just about indistinguishable from capitalism. A lot of people in the bottom left would call a system like that state capitalism. And that's why I would never call Marxism scientific socialism. I don't think Marx and Engels' theories about history and the state were arrived at through science. Today we could look at what psychologists say about the effects of power. We could use anthropology to learn about how different cultures avoid hierarchy and remain egalitarian. I'll actually put a, a link to a great book on that subject in the description. Either way, it's not easy to derive universal laws by analyzing history, but I do think the corrupting influence of power is really well documented in history books. If someone is upper left, the authoritarian left, they must favor giving power, or maybe right at the top, absolute power, to a small elite. And when you concentrate power that way, it doesn't matter what the design of the state is. If it's supposed to provide for everyone or supposed to guarantee everyone's freedom, 
it doesn't matter. Everyone loses their freedom and justice is unavailable. So what if you propose letting a committee of delegates from local communities choose the supreme leader? And, uh, and those delegates were only able to vote the way the local communities allowed them to, like real representatives. Well, then you've moved from way up here, you've moved down a little bit. What if you want the local representatives to elect the whole cabinet or politburo or whatever you want to call it? Then you've moved down a little bit more. What if membership in this confederation is optional and communities are allowed to secede? Well, then it's much less authoritarian, isn't it? What if we do away with the upper class or upper level of decision makers altogether? And any decisions we have to make collectively will only be made with the consent of those concerned. Then we're way down here approximating the vision of early anarchists like Bakunin, who talked about uh, loosely knit confederations that would come together in times of crisis but wouldn't have the power to force each other. It could be a confederation based on the old structure of a city or state or country, and then a confederation of confederations, similar to how we would think of international organizations like the UN or NATO, today, but again, acting and operating only with the express consent of the people whose interests they're supposed to advance. To people at the libertarian end of the spectrum, forcing people to accept systems and laws they have not agreed to makes those systems and laws illegitimate. Consent is everything. So you can see the real differences between authoritarian and libertarian mindsets. The more authoritarian thinkers consider it preferable or maybe just inevitable that some people hold power over others. The further down you go, the more important it is to you that they prove the assumptions behind that thinking. Who says it's inevitable some people have power over others? Who says those people in power keep order? I can show you how they create disorder. And organization? Organization happens at the grassroots. That's down here. Concentrating power means taking power away from most people. If they can't prove to the people they're claiming power over that they should have power, it's not legitimate, and rebellion is. But when you rebel, please don't create another state. If you really believe in communism, build communist structures today. The ends of the revolution should be reflected in the means. One might say must be reflected in the means. The sooner the seeds of a self-organizing egalitarian mutual aid society are planted, the better. It's not about securing the power of the state somehow, but of having strong, caring, compassionate communities, loving families, educated children, satisfied adults. No slavery, no oppression, no kicking people out of their homes because they don't pay you money to live there. People need to liberate themselves. I can help you break out of prison, but I can't be the one to decide you are free. Only you can do that. Only you can free your mind. So even if there was a successful leftist uprising against the state, some number of people would not be ready for the freedom and consequent responsibility. But we can build structures now that mirror the ones we want for the future. We can provide things like food, shelter, and education for free. We can help make our communities self-sufficient, growing food, building homes for each other, learning self-defense. Living in stronger communities has all kinds of benefits to us, regardless of whether or not it becomes the basis of a revolt. And people are already doing it. They're fighting for better wages and working conditions, and community autonomy, and they're winning. They're building houses for each other and handing out food. And in recent years, millions of people have been sending strangers money online because the strangers are in trouble. That's the world we want, isn't it? 
It happens outside the state. It weakens the capitalist system by reducing our reliance on it. It ensures us against the worst effects of collapse. It's not surprising most people don't understand radical ideas and leftist thinking. For one, it's been drilled into our heads since birth that socialism, communism, and anarchism could not possibly work. For whatever reasons, I could easily answer if I was there with the child as it's being indoctrinated. For another, even the people who might listen to you simply aren't curious enough. They probably won't read radical theory, which is okay. I'm not trying to be an elitist. You don't need to read theory if you get how it works. Theory is mostly for people like me who want to get things right and then translate concepts into words and then I can spread them. Being incurious is not a crime, especially about philosophy, theory, and all the stuff we're talking about like government and capitalism. These can be really dry subjects. Why read when you could watch the Avengers kick Thanos' ass? Well, because it's a great way to unlearn all the bullshit you've picked up. But of course, it's, it's overwhelming. There are so many books, so many authors and philosophers. I know, I know. But if you want somewhere to start with, um, a lot of people of my persuasion would recommend The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, also known as The Bread Book. What is Property by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Uh, or maybe The Ego and Its Own by Max Stirner. If you prefer fiction, try Ursula, Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed, or anything by her. There are links to all these books in the description. Fortunately, there are places online where the books have been distilled into videos and memes. Of course, it's not the same as reading the books, but you can often at least get the gist of it. That's it for my video on the left. There's one more video in this series about the political compass, so stay tuned. Thanks, folks.